Good morning, East Auburn. How we doing? Doing good? Well, you're looking pretty good. It's nice to have each and every one of you here this morning. Um, as usual, we have a lot going on here at East Auburn. So uh, it's exciting and it's great to have you here. Want to draw attention to a Thanksgiving Eve service. That is actually the night before Thanksgiving for those who don't know. Uh, it's at 6.30, it's Wednesday, it's time of testimony, it's a great time of sharing of God's blessing. Also, Silver Wings uh, has a dinner, November 29th, it's a luncheon actually, 11 o'clock, Tuesday, and uh, you're asked to bring a side um, dish, uh, the turkey will be provided, hope to see you there. Also, we need a spectacular prayer team. That kind of, sounds kind of odd, but we need a prayer team for Christmas Spectacular. And uh, you can see Jody out in the uh, hallway if you'd like to be praying for this year's presentation. Also, if you have worked security before, we could use you on the security team because there's a lot of, a lot of outreach, outreach presentations, 14 of them, so we could use the help. Also, Pastor Russ has a insert. It says 10,000 reasons to be thankful. And you can fill that out and put it in the jar. And um, Ann, can you put it out, out there too or just in the jar? Just in the jar and we'll put it on the wall. So we want you to be a part of that. Also, uh, Gene and Carol Bailey, they're going to come up and they're gonna pray over the, the shoe boxes that are gonna go all the way around the world and they're gonna change a child's life. Give them the love of Jesus and the gospel. So if you guys would come and, and do that now, we'd appreciate it. Thanks, Gene. Good morning. Carol won't be here for this service. She's up preparing for Sunday school and when I'm here, finished here, I'll go up and help her. Uh, so when we, uh, well, if you've been here over the past couple of months, you've heard Pastor talking about be the church and about gathering and scattering. Well, that's what uh, we've been doing with the Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes. Uh, we sent out 700 of them that were empty for you folks to fill and put a greeting in and so forth. And as of this moment, we have exactly 800 back just from East Auburn. <laughs> So some of you decorated your own shoebox or had some from last year or whatever, but uh, on behalf of Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan's Purse, I want to thank you for your part in getting the gospel out, because that's what this really is about. Uh, it's nice to give children who are underprivileged gifts that our, our kids would think were nothing but mean the world to those kids in impoverished countries who receive them. But beyond that, they receive a gospel message and they have an opportunity if they're interested to take a 12-week course that talks about everything from creation to the fall of man to Christ coming to save us and so forth. It's just a great thing. It's amazing and it's a real shot in the arm to pastors in 170 countries and territories because they organize getting all these kids together, invite them and say, we have a free gift for you. And, and every child also has siblings usually and parents and friends and neighbors and so the impact goes way beyond even just that child so i would invite you to pray with me over these shoe boxes <clears throat> as they get sent out around the world so let's pray father god we thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this to be the church it seems like such a small thing to us to put a few items in a shoebox and send it off. And yet, to the child receiving it, it it's an amazing show of love, um, not just in the gift itself, but to think that somebody halfway across the world loves them because of God, and that God loves them and cares enough about them to get this to them. And Father, we trust that every single shoebox is going to go to just the right person. Many times we've heard stories of children who prayed for a certain thing and it came in the shoebox just like you intended it. And we thank you for that. What a extra touch of showing your personal love to each of these children. 
Thank you for what you're going to do and the impact it'll have for the kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, you know, it's our honor to be here to uh, help lead you guys worship today. So would you stand with us? And we're in a season of thankfulness. Um, one of the things we can be thankful for is that his mercies are new every day. Doesn't matter what happened yesterday, doesn't just every day. So uh, we're going to sing about his mercies being new and being thankful enough to where we can trust him.
sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new
thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame.
You may be seated. built an amazing church this weekend and uh, it's great to see you all here. Let's continue to in our worship and go before God in prayer. God, we we are thankful, Father, that the way you, way you provide for us, Father, the way that you meet our daily needs, God, we're not worthy but yet you still deliver consistently. Help us to receive, Lord. Help us then to take that and look to see how we can provide and give to others. Thankful that we have a church that looks to serve in our outreach. God, we lift before the cast and crew that are going to be part of Christmas Spectacular as they as they share the gospel, as they uh, bring people into this season, Lord, with joy. We pray for health on them, and we thank you for their, their commitment. As over thousands of people will walk through these doors in the next few weeks, Lord, prepare their hearts now to receive your word. God, we're thankful for our staff and teens that meet needs, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week as these doors are open to our community as we continue to push back the darkness. Thank you, Father, that we're able to be a light. We're thankful for those like Carol and Jean who are passionate about Christmas um, shoeboxes. And God, we're thankful that we can come alongside an organization like Samaritan's Purse and touch little lives all around the world. And we hope we see over a thousand boxes go out next year because of the commitment and the dedication of the people here. God, we have many to be lifting up before you in prayer today, but we, we think of uh, Dave Chase and our Infecto's families, Lord, as they have passed. We're thankful that they're in your presence. Be with the family as they mourn, Lord. Help us to come alongside them, give them comfort and care. Be with Pete Lara, Lord, as he continues in his journey of health, and we pray for strength in him. God, we lift up Eric Boyer. We pray for a match for his um, bone marrow match, Lord. We pray that you will be with him and his family as they continue on their journey for recovery. God, we're thankful for the military personnel from our church who serve. We lift them before you. God, we specifically lift up Dylan Carl this morning. and God, we th we're thankful for him. Keep a hedge of protection around him, Lord. Thank you for his commitment to service. God, we're thankful for the Maycomers who serve around the world and the work that they do, Lord. We're thankful for their commitment as missionaries in the field, in the trenches, doing the work. Thank you, Lord, for their commitment. God, be with Pastor Russ as he continues in this series. Gratitude, Lord. Help us as we take the word today, as we go into Thanksgiving week, Lord, that we will use these words to just search our own heart and recognize, Lord, the changes that we need to make. God, we are grateful for your mercies every single day. We thank you and praise you in your son's name. Amen. time. 
Thank you, Karen. What an awesome song that is, isn't it? Pour out our praises to the Lord. Let us pray together before we begin today with this message. Our Father in heaven, our debt is great, Lord, but you have seen fit to pour out your forgiveness and your grace upon us undeservedly. Our hearts are drawn to you now, Lord, and we pour out our thanksgiving to you, not only in song and in prayers, but as we look into your word, Lord God, may you make it come alive in our hearts that we might be more conformed to the image of your son, Jesus, in whose name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, Luke chapter 12 and verse 1 says this, by this time, the crowd, unwieldy and stepping on each other's toes, numbered into the thousands. I have two words for you this morning. Black Friday. <laughs> Black Friday. How many of you succumb to the hysteria of Black Friday? And how early do you succumb to it? Because I've been seeing early Black Friday deals advertised on my iPad and on my cell phone for weeks and flyers in the mail. I remember the pre-COVID days when people would line up outside of storefronts. You remember that? Hours before opening to get in before those greedy people. <laughs> now, I remember reading years ago that lines formed outside of, of Coach and Gucci in New York City as early as 7 p.m. on Thursday the night before. And that same year, according to CNN, before its opening, an estimated 10,000 people waited outside Macy's flagship store on Herald Square in New York. 10,000 people waiting to get in. I'm consistently amazed at the reaction to Black Friday. Actually, I guess I shouldn't be. It's typical of the cultural climate in which we live, isn't it? Sort of reminds me of what takes place here on ticket day at East Auburn Baptist Church. <laughs> or, or a new long-awaited movie finally arrives and people want to get in before the first showing. And how about just recently that's in the news, this whole Taylor Swift Ticketmaster controversy where a record 2.4 million tickets were sold in one day for pre-sale to her concert tour. So much so it crashed the whole system. I mean, it all transports me back to another time and another culture in which people were crowding in to get a piece of another kingdom. Listen to these words in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And news about him spread throughout all of Syria and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. So as Jesus went about proclaiming the kingdom and the good news of another kingdom, his popularity grew to the point where thousands of people pressed in for their place, actually trampling on one another, according to Luke 12, which we just saw, and even tearing the roofs off of houses to get to him to let down a paralytic to be healed because they couldn't get in because of the mass crowd that was outside the house. Later, during his, the midpoint of his public ministry, as one scholar has observed, Jesus spoke of a remarkable change that had occurred when his cousin John the Baptizer passed the torch onto him. And in Luke 16, verse 16, Luke records Jesus is making this provocative statement. He said, quote, the law and the prophets were proclaimed until John, and since then the gospel of the kingdom is preached. And everyone is forcing his way into it. Now, John, the Baptist, functioned within the limited framework uh, and proprieties of the official practices and rituals of the Jewish religion. 
the law and the prophets, as the phrase was often used. But Jesus, however, revealed a radically new concept when he came on the scene. The concept that the kingdom of God, through the gospel of Jesus, was available not simply to the few who were experts in the law or to those who appeared to be perfectly righteous, but rather through the person of Jesus himself and faith in him, the kingdom becomes available to anyone who truly desires it. Anyone. Now that, my friends, is something worth camping out for, isn't it? More than just a ticket to a couple of hours of fantasy or some early Christmas shopping, the gospel of God's grace is a doorway to eternal life. And in a world of ungrace, you would expect that people would not only be waiting for that, but for crowding in to experience it. Amen? Let me ask you a question. How have you responded to that message? Have you shrugged it off as, as merely another option in an array of innumerable choices that we have? Or do you realize the incomparable worth of that gift? To what length would you go to express your gratitude and your love for the grace that has been made available to you? In Luke's gospel, there is an account that forces each of us to face our own response to Jesus' gift of grace and forgiveness and to evaluate how much we truly value it. I warn you, as we look at this story today, that to place yourself in this story will reveal not only the sincerity of your love for Jesus, but also the genuineness of your repentance towards sin and your faith in Christ. It will expose how seriously you and I as Christians take the fact that we have been forgiven. Or it will reveal how flippantly we pass that off. Here's the deal. The grace of God's forgiveness should make our hearts overflow with the gratitude of our love. Amen? So I want to ask you, how you, would you rate your love for Jesus? If you have a piece of paper, you can write the following on the back, just four things. And you can rate yourself throughout this, this message as you look at yourself in terms of what we're going to look at today in this story. Four words, extreme, your love for Jesus. Is it extreme, willing to risk embarrassment, humiliation, ridicule, and rejection? Or would you say it's moderate, quiet and composed, content to keep it to yourself unless others open, are open with it? Or questionable, not willing to expose yourself as one of his followers? Or maybe hypocritical, aloof and above it all, outwardly well put together, but inwardly dying. Those four things, how would you rate yourself in those things? Somewhere in the midst of this message, I suggest to you that the reality of your answer is gonna surface. And I wanna challenge each of you this morning to answer this question. In the face of such great forgiveness, how have you responded? I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7, and we're going to look at verses 36 to 50. Let me read them to you right now. It'll be on the screen. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting to him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume and standing behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with, her ha with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman person this woman is who is touching him that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, Lord, or say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? 
Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. And for this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. And those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who forgive, even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let me ask you, with whom do you identify with in this story? With whom do you identify? Let's take a look at the setting for a minute, a little closer. Some people associate this story with the, same, with the story in Matthew 12, Mark 14, and John 12, where Mary of Bethany anoints Jesus with perfume. But the differences here are very apparent. One occurs just before Jesus is crucified. The host is a leper, not a Pharisee, and perfume is poured on Jesus' head. And the controversy in that situation surrounds the cost of the ointment, not the character of the woman. So this incident, while it seems very familiar, is a totally different incident. Let's look at Simon's invitation in verse 36. Now, one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him. And so Jesus entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now, if there's one thing that Jesus cannot be accused of, it's playing favorites or being exclusive. Now, although we read that many accused him of spending so much time in keeping company with tax gatherers and sinners, Jesus didn't obviously here shrink away from accepting the invitation to dine in the home of this Pharisee named Simon. Although many of the Pharisees steered very clear of being intimately associated with Jesus, Simon actually invited Jesus to share table fellowship with him, a sign of intimate communion and Jesus actually accepted that. Now, make no mistake about it, Jesus loved the Pharisees and made himself available to them every bit as much as he did the rest of the world. He loved Simon, I'm sure of it, and his desire for him was for him to be saved and to come to now the knowledge of the truth, as it says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. But Jesus' ministry I suggest to you, was not one-sided. It was, wasn't limited by social or religious distinctions. It seemed that Simon's motives, however, may have been questionable as to why he invited Jesus into his home. He certainly hadn't treated Jesus with the customary respect typical of Eastern hospitality. No, was Simon really interested in what Jesus had to say? Or... Was he simply patronizing Jesus, looking for an opportunity to catch him off guard? As they reclined around the table, an amazing encounter takes place. This woman intrudes into the scene in verses 37 and 38, which we just read about. So there was a woman, it says, and there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. Now, it's interesting that in the original language, Luke writes it like this, and behold, there was a woman in the city. Some of your versions may reflect that. The ESV does and the New King James Version does. But Luke is actually trying to make an effort here to point out this very unusual occurrence. It's as if as Luke is telling the story and he says this. He says, and get this. Get this. In the midst of this dinner, a woman, a known sinner, finds out that Jesus is there and she just waltzes right in. 
Now, in the Near Eastern culture of Jesus' day, I have to tell you that it was not unusual for spectators to be allowed to walk in and out of a person's home during meals, which involved notable persons. Yet, the fact that a noted sinner, and the original word for that in here means immoral woman, likely recognized and known as a prostitute, would venture in to a, a situation like that was entirely unexpected. In fact, according to one source, it was not customary for any woman to appear under any circumstances on such an occasion, much less a woman unveiled as she was. So somewhere along the line, this woman must have heard Jesus speak about the forgiveness and grace that was available to anyone who would come to him, and it is quite possible that she even heard him speak to that on that very day. Well, she knew in her heart that she totally missed the mark of God's kingdom and that she wasn't kidding herself at all. There was no way she thought that she was getting into the kingdom of God and the so-called holy people like Simon the Pharisee made it a habit of reminding her of that fact by the way that they treated her. But nothing is said of her identity here other than the fact that she was a sinner. Some people suggest that it was Mary, of Mag Mary Magdalene a, a t from a town between Capernaum and Tiberias, but there's no scriptural warrant for that whatsoever. But the one thing that we do know about her is that she risked a ton to walk into that room the way she did and do what she did. And we know something else, according to the text, that it was not an accident. The text says, in verse 37, that when she learned where Jesus was, she went intentionally with this costly article of her gratitude and affection. Listen to what the message, how the message translates this or paraphrases it. Just then a woman of the village, a town harlot, having learned that Jesus was a guest in the home of the Pharisee, came with a bottle of very expensive perfume and stood at his feet, weeping, raining tears on his feet. Letting down her hair, she dried his feet, kissed them, and anointed them with the perfume. Now, it's almost impossible to explain the shock waves that must have vibrated through that house at that point. This woman was falling all over Jesus. She was weeping. Actually, the word in the original language means to wail, to cry out loud. It's the same word, actually, that's used of Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem. It's the same word that is used of Peter's reaction to his own betrayal and denial of his friend and Lord, Jesus Christ, in Matthew 26. It's also the same word that's used of Mary Magdalene's wailing and weeping at the tomb of Jesus in John chapter 20. You know what's happening here? This woman is making an absolute scene. An absolute scene. Her hair was down, which was a shameful thing for a woman in public, and she was not only touching Jesus, but she was kissing his feet continually and repeatedly, nonstop. Now, can you imagine with me for one moment that Roger's up here preaching from Sunday, and a woman walks in from the back of the room off the street and makes her way up to the stage and starts wailing and pouring herself all over Roger because he's preaching the gospel. How uncomfortable would you be? How uncomfortable would Roger be? How uncomfortable do you think Barb would be? See, we can't really get into this scene until we start thinking in those kinds of terms because in order to understand the scandal of this scene, we need to understand the Jewish mindset toward women then. It was forbidden, absolutely forbidden, for a rabbi to even greet a woman in public. 
A rabbi might not even speak to his own wife or daughter or sister in public, according to their rules. According to commentator William Barclay, there were even Pharisees who were called the bruised and the bleeding Pharisees because when they encountered a woman on the street, they shut their eyes and they would walk into the side of buildings. <laughs> this is true. For a rabbi to be seen speaking to a woman in public was absolutely the end of his reputation. Rabbis in that day literally despised women. You know, they had sayings like this, quote, better that the words of the law should be burned than delivered to a woman, unquote. And prayers that went like this, quote, blessed art thou, O Lord, who has not made me a woman, a heathen, or an illiterate, unquote. These are right from their writings. And Jesus, yet Jesus did the unthinkable, he did the unconventionable, shattering their heartless concern for people, especially women. He not only spoke with this women, with, with, with women generally, and involved them in his teaching ministry, but was here welcoming their physical contact and outward expressions of love, unashamedly. You know, Simon never said a word to either the woman nor to Jesus but he was thinking things in his heart. And he began to use this event as a reason to reject Jesus. And that's where we start to get to the heart of the problem. Verse 39. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. So here's the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem was a problem with his heart. Simon made several mistakes, and they are typical mistakes that every Christian in this room, including myself, has made probably and can make if we're not careful. He labeled the woman, he disdained the Savior, and he exposed his own sinful heart in the process. Let's unpack that a little bit. He labeled the woman. I read once that the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche spoke of his ability to smell the inmost parts of every soul, especially the, quote, abundant hidden dirt at the bottom of many a character, unquote. Now, on the other hand, author Philip Yancey wrote that we are called to do just the opposite of that, to smell the residue of hidden worth in every soul. Let me ask you a question. Which one do you and I engage in more frequently? Do we judge people? Label them? Are you a labeler? Or do we first off see the hidden worth in every soul? You see, Simon's reaction here kind of convicts me. Does it convict you? We can all think of a time when we've attached an ungracious label to someone based on their appearance or on our preconceived prejudice of who they are. We've acted exactly like Simon at times, haven't we? He compared this woman's reputation to his own dignified position, thinking he was closer to the kingdom than she was, and yet, in fact, the very opposite was true. This religious leader supposed the woman to be a sinner in the worst degree, unpardonable and unpardoned, and Jesus said that she was neither. As we later find out, Jesus proclaimed her forgiven of all of her many sins. She had come to Christ as a result of her repentant heart and her faith in Christ. In Simon's eyes and in the world's estimation, she was a worthless sinner, yet before the throne of God, she was a new creature. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it this way, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ became, becomes a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. That's grace, isn't it? Not only did Simon label the woman, but he disdained the Savior. Recognizing that Jesus was not repulsed by this woman's approach, he used it as proof that Jesus could not be a prophet because no prophet, much less the Messiah, could associate with such a low life in his 
estimation. And that view, sadly, has managed to sustain itself all throughout the history of religion, hasn't it? Do you think some of us may have the same difficulty sometimes? Someone has said that one who has been touched by grace will no longer look on those who stray as those evil people or those poor people who need our help. Nor what must we search for love worthiness. Grace teaches us that God loves because of who God is, not because of who we are. Categories of worthiness do not apply. You know, the Apostle Paul felt it necessary to remind us of that fact that we should malign no one, to be uncontentious, gentle, showing every consideration of all men. You know why? Because in Titus 3, it says this, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now that is something to be thankful for, isn't it? 10,000 reasons to list on a piece of paper and put in a jar is not nearly enough knowing what we've received from Jesus undeservedly. Even though Simon never uttered a word here, Jesus knew exactly what he was thinking in his heart. He saw the emptiness of it. He could smell it a mile away. In the words of German theologian Helmut Thielicke, quote, the sulfurous stench of hell is as nothing compared with the evil odor emitted by divine grace gone putrid, unquote. Wow, that is, that's a mouthful, isn't it? The atmosphere here was choked with the fumes of Simon's ungrace. He labeled the woman, he disdained the Savior, and in the process, he exposed his own sinful heart. Again, the heart of the problem was a problem with his heart. He compared himself with the woman, he patronized Jesus, and he indicted himself in the process. He despised this woman, and he was on his way to despising Jesus as well. He saw no distinction between the woman's former sins and the woman herself. They were one and the same, in his opinion. And don't we do the same thing? But we have phrases that we say, like, hate the sin, love the sinner, right? Make that distinction. But how hard is that to do? Hating the sin while loving the sinner is indeed difficult to practice, isn't it? Yet it was the example of Jesus Christ. Author C.S. Lewis readily admitted that he had a difficult time with the hair-splitting distinction between hating a person's sin and hating the sinner. How could you hate what a person did, he asks, and not hate the person? But years later in his classic work, Mere Christianity, this is what he wrote. Quote, it occurred to me that there was one man to whom I'd been doing this all my life, namely myself. However much I might dislike my own cowardice or conceit or greed, I went on loving myself. There had never been the slightest difficulty about it, he says. In fact, the very reason why I hated the things was that I loved the man. Just because I loved myself, I was sorry to find that I was the sort of man who did those sinful things, unquote. So it's possible to hate the sin and love the sinner, isn't it? It was not Simon's hatred of sin, however, that needed to be compromised. Rather, it was the fact that he hated it more in the woman than he did in himself. That was the problem. He didn't realize his own need. And I wonder how often we fail to realize just how much we need the forgiveness of Christ on a daily basis. Every day. 
And that brings us precisely to the point of the whole story. As author Ken Geyer pointed out, Jesus proves himself to be a prophet not by discerning the morals of the woman, but by discerning the mindset of the host. He clears up the confusion in Simon's mind with a parable. And this is, I love the way Jesus brings conviction in a person's heart, right? He doesn't accost them. He just tells them a story. And he lets the story do the, do the work. Verses 40 to 43. Jesus said, Simon, I've got something to say to you. And the Pharisee says, well, go ahead and say it, teacher. I wonder what kind of tone he used when he said that. A money lender had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to pay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Which of them will love him more? That's the question. And the point is, is that the size of the debt didn't matter in the least to the creditor. One man owed nearly two years' worth of wages, the other barely two months' worth of wages. Neither one of them could pay. They were both hopelessly insolvent, both helplessly bankrupt, yet both were freely forgiven for all of it. Jesus asked Simon a question with a very obvious answer. Who will love him more? And Simon gave the answer with proud indifference, I'm sure. I suppose, he says, the one who was forgiven more. Precisely. Which brings Jesus and Simon to the crux of the issue. Verse 44. And turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. She's wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but since the time she came in, she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. And for this reason, I say to her, to you, Simon, that her sins, which were countless, which were many, have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he was forgiven little, loves little. See, the debt in question here is not the prostitute's debt, but the Pharisee's debt. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. And then he turned to the woman, and he asked one of the most important questions in this text. He asked Simon, do you see this woman? Notice he didn't say, do you see this sinner? Do you see this woman? In a scene from an old movie, characters played by Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep stumble across this old Inuit woman lying in the, on the ground, possibly drunk. Besotted themselves, the two debate what they should do about her. Is she drunk or a bum, asked Nicholson. Just a bum, Streep says, been all of her life. And before that, well, she was a prostitute in Alaska. She hasn't been a prostitute all her life before that. I don't know, just a little kid, I guess. Well, a little kid is something. It's not a bum. It's not a prostitute. It's something. So let's take her in and care for her. See, the two vagrants were seeing this Inuit woman through the lens of grace, one author wrote. Where society saw only a bum and a prostitute, grace saw a little kid, a person made in the image of God, no matter how defaced that image had become. Simon, Jesus said, look at this woman. Look at this woman. Do you even see her as a person? Consider this woman more carefully, Simon, because from the moment I came into your house, you didn't even see me. You withheld from me the low-cost, ordinary courtesies while she bestowed on me the most cost costly and rare respect. You didn't give me the customary greeting of water for my feet, Yet she has showered them with her tears and dried them with her hair. You weren't cordial enough to meet, greet me with even, with even a welcome 
but she has not stopped kissing my feet since the time I came in. You didn't anoint my head with the customary olive oil as a matter of hospitality and respect, yet she's poured out rare and expensive ointment, probably her most valued possession willingly on my feet. Simon, who do you think has shown me more love in this situation? Who do you think has really valued my presence in this place? Who do you think understood their intense need of forgiveness more deeply? I'm telling you, Simon, that her sins which are indeed countless, have been forgiven. She has experienced the deliverance that I have come to offer by faith. She has proven it by her response of love. But Simon, a person that thinks they don't need any forgiveness, will also prove it by the way they respond to me. They'll take me for granted. They'll treat me with no respect or hospitality, and they will love me very little. So in the quietness of that room, Jesus drew the contrast between Simon and the streetwalker. And there is no mistaking Jesus' point. The way in which we love Christ is proportional to the grace we feel that we have received. How much forgiveness do you think was necessary to save your soul and mine? How much? Your estimate will determine the capacity by which you love and serve him. So how much are you willing to risk for Jesus' sake? How far will you go to show Jesus how much you love him? How much is too much? How much is how little is too little? You know, our reaction of love is proportional to our estimate of the forgiveness that we have received. No response means, means no recognition of need. No recognition of need means no repentance. No repentance means no forgiveness. C.S. Lewis has once said, prostitutes are in no danger of finding their present life so satisfactory that they cannot turn to God. The proud, the greedy, the self-righteous are in that danger. Seeing only this woman's past reputation, Simon was blind to his own need. What he failed to realize is that he needed Jesus every bit as much as that woman did. And so do you and so do I. And my friends... The ground is level at the foot of the cross, isn't it? The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Jesus came for the sick, not the well. He came for the unrighteous, not the righteous, he said. Where do you see yourself? Where do I see myself on that scale? Later on in Luke 15, Jesus would put it more bluntly. I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who needs no repentance, he says. Do you get nervous and uncomfortable around those who do not cover their great love for Jesus when they pour it out so openly? Does it make you nervous? Or maybe you're one of those that does. See, that's really the crux of this issue, isn't it? And it's very convicting to us. In the end, however, Jesus points Simon to one final thing, the truth of the matter. Verse 48, and he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace. Here's the truth of the matter, that the grace of God's forgiveness will overflow with gratitude of our love. Overflow with the gratitude of our love. How many things can you be thankful for and pour out your love toward Jesus this week? How many things? I don't think 10,000 is enough. Not even nearly enough. Was this woman forgiven because of her great love? Certainly not. Love was not was the result of the forgiveness that she had already received, if you read the text closely. Jesus didn't say your love has saved you. He said your faith has saved you. He said, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. 
So this woman of the night found in the Savior what she could never find on the street corner, forgiveness for her sins, salvation for her soul, and peace for her heart. From this text, I find that it takes at least two things to follow God's grace to come in and our love to pour out. Two things which brought this woman to Jesus, the lack of which kept Simon away. An admission of our depravity that we, we are sinners in need of his grace. And an attitude of humility which says, I need you, Jesus. Be my savior. We cannot find him, wrote Thomas Merton, unless we know we need him. And my friends, until we begin to see ourselves like the Pharisee in this story, it's going to be very hard for us to view ourselves like the woman. Here are the two best prayers I know, wrote Anne Lamott. Help me, help me, help me. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Which do you need to pray right now? Because Jesus is waiting. The altars are open for prayer. God bless you.